We're not going to get all the way through this. I don't expect to, at least, uh, through the book of Revelation. But if you'll turn to Revelation chapter number 1, is as good a place as any to get started. Revelation chapter number 1. And look with me, if you will, at verse number 1. And if you find that, if you'll stand, if you're physically able, and we'll read just verses 1, 2, and 3 of Revelation chapter number 1 tonight. Revelation 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Now listen to the words in verse number 3. If you weren't listening before, pay attention. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So, do you get a blessing from just reading the book of Revelation? Yes, you do. Will we get a blessing from studying this? Yes, we will. Will we get a blessing from hearing it read? Yes, we will. That's all a, a blessing to be able to, to read that promise that God will bless us uh, simply for studying it and thinking on these things. And again, the reason there is in the last phrase of verse number three, for the time is at hand. At any time, any moment, we, understood, we understand we can be in that place where roses never fade. Praise the Lord. If he comes back tonight, glory. Man, that would be wonderful. I'm looking forward to that day. Trust you are as well. Let's pray. Lord, again, thank you for the opportunity to get into your word. Help us understand what it's saying. Lord, this is a, a difficult, difficult book um, for many reasons. And so, Lord, give us just some sense as we kind of give it an overview. Uh, Lord, help us understand some things that you're trying to get across to us. Help us to see the big stuff, the big themes here, uh, so that it will help us to um, properly interpret uh, the things, that, the smaller, more minute details uh, of the book. And we'll thank you for the help. We ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. So if you've ever read any books about Revelation or you've tried to start studying Revelation, um, if you've done any kind of uh, looking into the book of Revelation, you know that you could have, um, you know, if you picked three different authors and you said, I'm going to learn what uh, Revelation has to say from three different men, they're going to have ten different things they're going to say about the book of Revelation. I mean, it's just, it's amazing how one guy will say one thing and then you turn a few pages and then... It's like he's almost contradicting what he said back here because it is, there's some confusion that goes on and we, we have a difficult time at times trying to make this part line up with this part and how does it all work together and how can I best understand that? And so that's just a, a caveat as we get started. Um, you might have heard, you may have read, you may believe a little bit different than the way that we're maybe going to approach this book and, and maybe some of the, the, the symbolism or some of the things that are enclosed in the book. And uh, if you came up to me and said, listen, I don't think you're right, I would say, I would look you right in your little cotton pick an eye and say, you're probably right, I don't know what's going on here. I'm trusting that... And the time that I have spent in studying and reading and praying and reading and then studying some more and then praying some more <laughs> and then reading some more uh, that I'm trying to get what God is saying here. But I, I wish I could have a, a firm certainty. But here's the deal when it comes to the book of Revelation. These things haven't taken place yet. So I don't know all that what is enclosed here. I don't know how it all kind of fits together per se. I don't, I'm not going to be able to tell you with exact certainty or with any uh, bit of dogmatism that this is what this means exactly. All right. So again, that's a little bit of a caveat. We're going to go through some parts of it. Now, this is an overview, all right? We're talking like a 30,000 foot overview of what the book is about and, and some parts of the book. We're not going to dive into, um, you know, how do the ten toes of Daniel fit into Revelation chapter number seven or chapter number six, or I'm not going to do that right now, so don't get mad at me right now, okay? We're just going to uh, kind of, again, give you some big chunks, big pieces, big themes and then as time passes and we're able to kind of come back to this book, we'll use what we're talking about tonight and use that to unpack what's in the book of Revelation. All right? 
So everybody's okay? We're going to come off the ledge and say, ah, oh, you're a heretic. You don't have any idea. Uh, well, I'm the only one. Good. All right. So um, either that or you're asleep tonight, which may be the case. I know it was a long day. So we won't, uh, we won't go through all this tonight. We're going to cover it. We'll probably break it up into a couple pieces here. But I want to, again, emphasize some things here. So with this book... We've been in a couple of different sections in our New Testament. We've talked about letters to churches. Uh, that began uh, really with the book of Romans. Uh, we've looked at letters to leaders. That was uh, uh, like 1 Second Timothy, 1 Second, uh, uh, sorry, 1 Second Timothy and Titus. Uh, we looked at letters to uh, individuals and, and uh, Christians. Uh, that was Hebrews and James and, and those books all the way to, uh, through the book of Jude. And now we've come here to the book of Revelation. And it's interesting because Revelation, as we kind of get into it here in just a couple minutes, you're going to see that it's... Is it a letter to churches? Yeah. Is it a letter to Christians? Yeah. Yeah, it's both of those things. All right? And so it, it kind of fits into both of those, those categories. All right? So as we understand it, as we know it, this book is about uh, the end of time as we know it and the ultimate fulfillment of what the Bible refers to as our blessed hope. I'm looking forward to the day when I get to see my Savior face to face. I cannot wait till that day. I mean, I'm just, I'm looking forward to that beyond measure. But until that time, I have a responsibility here on this earth. All right? I wish, see, if I was doing things, I'd get saved and then go right to heaven. So I didn't have to mess with all this stuff, this garbage that takes place on the earth on a daily basis. But God says, son, I've saved you for a reason, for a purpose. A big part of that reason and purpose is so that you might share this blessed hope of salvation with people around you. All right? and, and oftentimes we can look at this book of Revelation and hopefully we can understand from a Christian perspective, there is great blessing in reading this book, understanding what God is saying here. And we, we get a picture Though I think, honestly, it is a very uh, small, it's a very limited picture. We get some picture of what heaven is going to be like. Because I think if God gave us a grand picture, like a huge scheme of what heaven is and what it's going to be like, we couldn't stand it. It would blow our mind, one, and then we would, we would do silly things to try to get ourselves there, to be quite honest. It's just our mind couldn't even handle all of the great things that we're going to experience in heaven. And I'm telling you, uh, heaven is not what you and I make it out to be. All right? I've heard all kinds of silly things. And it happens usually when folks pass away or during funeral times or, you know, times when we're reminiscing about uh, friends who have gone on before and we're going to see them in heaven. I've heard there are fishing holes in heaven. I have heard there are golf courses in heaven. I have heard all kinds of weird stuff about heaven that I never read in the Bible. <laughs> because you and I, we know on this earth what we enjoy. And we think, okay, well, that is probably going to be in heaven also because I enjoy that. Well, not everybody likes golf. By the way, the reason why I go to he heaven is not to play golf. The reason why I go to heaven is because I get to see my Savior face to face. Right? Um, I've heard, you know, well, I'm going to ask these questions when I get to see Christ face to face. And I'm telling you, uh, when I read my Bible, you know what the first reaction is when people see uh, some glimpse of God's glory? Is they're on their knees, on their face, worshiping their Savior. Not asking questions about why didn't you include the fact that Adam may or may not have had a belly button in the Bible. Who cares about stuff like that, honestly? I want to kneel at my Savior's feet and say, thank you. Praise your holy name. And by the way, we're going to look at some verses where we are doing that. And that's a, that's a, a great, great thing. So, let's just kind of jump in here and we'll get as far as we, we can. The author of the book, we, we read it here in verse uh, number one. The author is John. The disciple of Jesus. Now, this is the same John that wrote the Gospel of John, the same John that wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And the book is called Revelation. Not Revelations, but Revelation, singular, all right? That word revelation literally is where we get our word apocalypse from, 
all right? And when you and I think of apocalypse, it's like, wow, science fiction movie. I mean, you can see the huge alien spaceship coming and, you know, people riding off into the sunset to try to kill the aliens and all those things. We'll, we'll mention that before in just a, a couple of minutes here. But that word apocalypse, apocalypse, apocalypse comes from uh, the, the word revelation in, in the Greek language. It means to uncover or to reveal. And that's what this book does. It, it uncovers or it reveals God's view of human history, all that's taken place on this earth, in light of what God knows to be the final end of time as you and I know it. All right? And so it's through that lens that we get all of these things revealed in this book of Revelation. Now, verse number three. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this. Here's what Revelation is. It's a prophecy. All right. Now, that word prophecy, I want to just take a, another brief time out. Prophecy, we get in our mind, that is the, like the foretelling of things. Um, you know, like you go down to the palm reader or the, the whoever, witch doctor, or whoever reads the magic ball, and you think, well, they can tell the future. No, they can't, for one. And two, that isn't always what prophecy means. Prophecy can mean either foretelling, telling the future, what's going to happen in future events, or the foretelling of truth, all right? So when a preacher gets up here to preach, the, one of the Bible words that they would use is a prophet. He is prophesying. He is foretelling God's truthful message, all right? When we say prophesying, it can mean future events, as it does oftentimes here in the book of Revelation, but it can also mean the forth-telling or the truth-telling of what is even going on right now. What, what is God's view on these subjects? And, and we'll look at that here as the, I think the book of Revelation gives us an outline for how to understand how the book is laid out. So, foretelling, forth-telling, both of those things happen here in the book of Revelation. It is addressed to seven different churches. All right, that's who the, the, the letter is addressed to. And the number seven is seen throughout the book. Uh, it is a number of God's perfect completion. I'm not a real big uh, numerology person. That is, I don't put a whole lot of weight on numbers and numerology in the Bible. Uh, I've seen it used in different ways. And you, uh, you, you almost got to be a mathematician to try to figure out some of these, what the people consider to be Bible codes. I'm not real big into that. Uh, I think that to the Bible admonition is to come as a little child, that God wrote this we can understand uh, what he has given us to understand. And so I'm, I'm not real big on that, but I think God does use uh, those symbols and, and those numbers. But there's, there's seven different churches that this book is addressed to. Uh, the primary message, and here's the theme of the book of Revelation. Now here's where we get to your outline. The theme of the book of Revelation is this, simply God wins. <laughs> God wins. You want... You, uh, Anybody, uh, this is how I read. I was having this conversation with Jonathan earlier, and um, I, I enjoy reading, but if you tell me to read something, I'm not going to read it. I'm not going to do it. Um, we went and watched um, um, Alyssa be in Anne of Green Gables. Now, I've read part of Anne of Green Gables, but that's because I was supposed to, and somebody told me to do that, and I read it, and I'm like, this is garbage, and I chucked it over my shoulder, and I don't... So, is it right to confess tonight? None of my teachers are in this room. I uh, am f sorry, I'm sorry to admit this, but there were times when I went and got the cliff notes to a book <laughs> and read the dumb cliff notes rather than actual reading the book. What a sorry dog I am. I know, I know, I'm the first to admit that. But if you tell me to read something, I'm not going to read it. But if I want to read it, I'll read it. <laughs> well, that's so dumb. Uh, why, why is that the case? Why was I even talking about that? Um, to be going, oh, God wins. So I, I love reading, but there are times when if I don't want to read the, the book, I'll read the back of the book. You know, like I'll go through Barnes & Noble and I'll pick out a book. What is this about? And then I'll read the back of the book. And then sometimes it's like, well, I already read this. I can just put that back, back in there. Revelation is like reading the back of the book. God wins. So all of these other problems and, and struggles and trials and difficulties and, and when you and I are struggling and, and when we're going through tough times, go back to the book of Revelation and understand God wins. God, God is going to get victory over all of these things and ultimately God is going to get justice over every injustice that's happening right now. 
right? Praise the Lord for that. I'm glad about that. So God brings everything back. As we get to the end of the book of Revelation, God is bringing everything back to where it used to be, where he intended it to be. He fixes everything that was broken by the fall of man. And then all that has gone on after that. He does bring ultimate justice. And then he also, get this, we don't have any part in it really because he's all powerful he's the one that's winning the battles but he gives then rewards to us as his children well that sounds like a pretty good deal I don't have to fight the battle and he gives me rewards for being faithful in just a, even just a few things boy what a what a wonderful savior he is God God wins now as you think through the book, and, and some of you have done some study in it, some of you understand it, and some of you have no clue, really a whole lot of what is in there. You, you, you're a little bit scared maybe of that. Just understand that in, through the book, as we read through it, God has to ultimately and finally deal with sin and evil and unrepentant behavior. Right? And he does that in the book of Revelation. Now, the seven churches that, that we're, we're talking about, that this is addressed to, are listed in chapters 1 through 3, all right? And chapters 2 through 3, anybody have a red letter edition Bible? Now, chapters 2 and 3 are basically all red. That's Jesus directly addressing those churches, all right? Now, time out. Uh, just because it's red, is that the only place where Jesus speaks? No. He is the Word. He said all of it. All of it is Him. The red letter just helps us to know he is actually speaking at this point. All right? So, because some people, well, that's in red. I really want to pay attention to that. He is all of it. He is the Word of God. All right? So he said all of it. But it, help, it does help us to give us some, some understanding that, for example, chapter 2, chapter 3, all of that is read. Jesus is speaking directly to these seven churches. Now, these are real churches that existed in these cities. They would have been started about the same time as that gospel explosion, if we want to call it that, takes place in the book of Acts. As Acts happens and those, those thousands get saved and then persecution comes, what happens? Well, they spread out, you remember, to all the known world. We talked about that when we studied the book, the book of Acts. And so these churches would have been started about that time. Uh, for example, look at chapter number 2 and verse number 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, right. So this letter, this particular part of the letter is given to the pastor, if you will, the angel, the messenger at the church of Ephesus. This is the same church that we would read the book of Ephesians. It's addressed to the very same, same church, the very same individuals. And so the address that, that Jesus makes to each one of these churches, he's dealing with needs that are taking place or that are present in those specific churches. All right, uh, Many of these churches had problems. Yeah. Why? Because there's sinners in those churches. Right? And they're, they're dealing with one another. They're dealing with issues from the outside. They're dealing from issues from the inside. And so Jesus is addressing many of the problems and struggles and difficulties these churches are having. Now, you may have heard taught all right, that these churches are not necessarily uh, physical churches that, that they could write to, that they are uh, metaphorical in nature. In other words, that these seven churches are seven ages in church history. All right, so some people may have heard that. That, that can be a popular teaching, depending on really who's doing uh, the teaching. And, and the idea is that these seven churches, for example, the very first church that's mentioned would be the very first church age, if you will, all right? That, that age of gospel ministry and, and rapid growth and the gospel being sent out. And then that brings us to, so what that, that does is, though, that brings us to the very last church that's mentioned, the, ver, the, the, church, the seventh church that's mentioned is the church at Laodicea. And people would say that, that, hold on to this view, that we are in, in a Laodicean church age, right? I don't put personally, okay, this is, this is my personal opinion, I don't put very much stock in that, and I'll give you a couple reasons why here, all right? I think these are, are literal, actual churches that are being addressed in these first three chapters here in Revelation, all right? Now, would I agree that today... There are churches that have a liberal viewpoint on how they do ministry. There's no question about that. 
Would I have the viewpoint that there are people who are misrepresenting the gospel, misusing the gospel, that are apathetic, that, are, that have all kinds of goods and they're not doing anything with the gospel message? Would I, would I say that's taking place today? There's no question about that. Do I also think that there, are, there were churches like that in the very first century? Yes. Yes. Do I think that there are churches, for example, like Smyrna, and, and what Smyrna means is crushed, and people would say, well, because that's what that means, uh, that was the time of the church age when much persecution was going on in the church, all right? Did we have churches undergoing persecution in the first century? Yes, all kinds of them, all right? Do we have churches today that are undergoing persecution? You better believe that we do, all right? So do you understand that we can find all kinds of these seven churches, we can find the same things going on in our, our day and time. We can find the, the same thing going on in these churches that were happening in the very first century, if you will, A.D. And so to say that these are church ages for me doesn't hold much water because we can find these kind of churches in all of these ages, in every stage of church history. All right? Point number two. Now this isn't on your outline. This is just for free. All right? Point number two, do you believe in the imminent return of Christ? That is, that the very next thing on God's timetable, so to speak, is the rapture of the church off of the earth, all right? Do you believe that at any moment in time, Jesus Christ could come in the clouds as it is described uh, in uh, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians? Do you believe that? If the answer is yes which would be a historical position for people, for the disciples, uh, for early church fathers, and on down through church history, if you believe that, then to say that these are church ages does away with the imminency or the imminent return of Christ. For example, if I'm in the Smyrna age, I have to wait a bit until Christ comes back. Does that make sense? So until I get to the Laodicean age, now I can really look forward to Christ coming before. If I was born before, too bad, so sad, you're out of luck. Because Jesus wasn't really coming back until all of these took place. All right? So to say that, again, these are, are, are certain ages in our church history, I think is a, a, a short-sighted view of interpretation. And by the way, I would say, here's the third thought, the Bible never tells us that's exactly what's going on here. Every indication of, is that these are actual churches that Jesus is addressing in Revelation 1, 2, and 3. All right? Um, I, I want you to see some verses, and I want you to see why we believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. All right? And I want you to, you to see the words of the men who God used to write your Bible. Uh, look, hold your place in Revelation. Look back at 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. Sorry, chapter 4, look at verse 15. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 15. First Thessalonians 4, 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Now who are those that are asleep? Those are those that have passed away. All right? We're not going to keep them from going to heaven. Verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then, what's the pronoun used by Paul? We. So he's speaking of he himself, and those believers in the, in the church at Thessalonica that he was writing to, then we which are, what, alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall, oh, here it is again, we ever be with the Lord. Now, was Paul just being uh, kind in saying that, or uh, in some way just trying to include everyone, or do we believe that this was given by inspiration of God? And that he used the word we for a reason for a purpose. Because he believed that this is what was actually coming. And God is trying to help him understand it can come at any time. That's the position I would hold. Right? So, look at verse number 18. 
Wherefore, because of this, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So if Jesus could come back at any time, is that a comforting thought? It is to me. Praise the Lord. Huh? I'll jump up if you can, you know, just so I can beat you there. All right? So we can find comfort. Both them in Thessalonica in the first century, and you and I today in 2017, almost 2018, we can find comfort. Why? Because we have a promise that at any moment in time, Christ could come in the clouds, and we would go to meet Him in the air. All right? Uh, look at uh, Philippians. You're, you're close there. Go left a little bit. Philippians chapter number 3. Philippians 3 and verse number 20. For our conversation is where? where, where do, what, are, what are we speaking about? What is our life? Our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you understand if, if there was going to be some delay in time period, why would we be looking for Him? Wouldn't we be looking for what's going to come next? Right? That should be Christ. Uh, look at Titus. Go right now. Titus chapter number 2, verse number 13. This is where we get that phrase, blessed hope. Titus 2.13. Looking for what? That blessed hope. What is the blessed hope? And the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Right? Anytime. Uh, you're close again. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy 6. Verse number 14. Who's writing 1 Timothy, remember? Oh good, these are making a difference in your life, I can tell. Paul is writing, the first, is writing 1 Timothy to the man named Timothy, who was a pastor. And he's writing to encourage him to stay faithful in the ministry. All right, Don't be, be on guard against false teaching and all of these kinds of things. And so he says, 1 Timothy 6.14, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, when? Until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Timothy, Christ is coming back soon. Until He does, you keep faithful. You, you keep this doctrine true. You keep preaching it pure. Why? Because He can come back at any time. And you and I are looking for that blessed hope. Um, one or two more. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Look at verse number 10. I'm just trying to help you understand and build a case and be able to interpret your Bible. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1, verse 10. First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.10, And to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. And there's a couple things in that verse. Number one, we're to wait for His Son from heaven. That's the very next thing. All right? that's, the, that's what the language is speaking about. Wait for His Son from heaven. And then as we get into Revelation, we're going to talk a little bit about this. But notice the last phrase in 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse number 10. Right? Because there is coming this um, kind of wave of this, this belief, and it, it kind of has gone in cycles. It's, it's similar, honestly, to Calvinism. Um, but it's this belief that those of us who are saved will go through at least part of the tribulation. All right? But notice what God's Word says here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and verse number 10. Even Jesus, which, what's the next word? Delivered us... From what? From the wrath to come. Question. What did God pour out on Jesus Christ on the cross when He was crucified? He poured out His wrath on His Son. Right? That's what He did. That's a, the Bible describes that very clearly. Jesus Christ was made sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. 
So God placed, on, on, when, when Christ was crucified on Calvary, God placed every sin that you ever will commit, every sin you ever have committed, every sin you committed today, He put that on His Son, Jesus Christ. And the Bible declares that He turned His back on His Son because He, because he could not stand to look at Him anymore because He was literally made to be your sin. And He pours out His wrath on His Son. Why? I believe that verse says, so that you and I who are saved don't have to suffer that wrath any longer. See, I don't have to suffer any wrath. I don't have to make up for uh, my sin. Christ already has done that for me. He has delivered me from wrath to come. So why would I be undergoing the judgment of God in the tribulation if God already did that unto His Son? Do you understand? See, I, I don't have to fear those things. I don't have to be wary of those things. And I fear sometimes that even in a study of the book of Revelation, some people get so tied up into prophecy and current events and, and, and world happenings and who is this and what is this and, and, and what does all this mean? And, and I, I can lose sight very quickly. If I just surround myself with that, I can lose sight of the very, very theme of the book. God wins this thing. I don't have to get an ulcer <laughs> over uh, whether or not Donald Trump moves the embassy to Jerusalem from Tel Aviv. Now, did he? Yes. Should I praise the Lord for that? Yes. That was a good decision. That's the right thing to do. By the way, uh, just because we recognize it as the capital, God already has and does. <laughs> so, you know, when some man just strokes a pen, he's just a man. How do I understand that? Because God wins. Do you understand that God is making and building a new Jerusalem that you and I are going to inhabit? And it's going to come down and it's going to be absolutely perfect. And it will be the center of eternity. So whether or not some U.S. citizens dwell there and it's the capital, which again, is the right thing to do, or not, should not make me into a stir. It shouldn't make me nervous or angry or whatever the case because I have already seen what happens in the end. God wins. I can trust my Father because He is always, 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 always in control. Amen. He knows. Right? Now, all that to say, He saved us from wrath to come. He's coming. The next thing on the timeline, uh, as we look at it prophetically, is the, the coming of Christ. Now, here's an important fact, all right? And, and this can be confusing, and, and we'll, we'll stop here in just a second. There is a difference between the rapture of Christ, the rapture of the, the saved, and the second coming of Christ. All right. What, what you might have heard also is the second advent of Christ. All right. When was the first advent of Jesus Christ? Anybody know? Um, why do we have Christmas stuff? It was Christmas, right? He came and was born on this earth in the form of a human, came to this earth so that he might live the perfect life, die the perfect death, shed his royal righteous blood, be buried and rise again the third day. All right. That was the first advent, the first coming. The rapture, Jesus never steps foot on this earth. We go to meet him in the air. All right? he, he, he brings us up. All right? uh, we would believe that this is pictured in Revelation chapter number 4. Uh, we, we read the verses in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, where, uh, come up hither, all right? uh, the voice of the Lord shall speak, and uh, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, dead in Christ shall rise to us, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air. All right? The second coming is, later on in the book of Revelation, the Bible declares that God opens heaven, and Jesus comes riding on a white horse with all the armies of heaven with him, and he fights that battle of Armageddon, and it's not even a battle. <laughs> the army, the enemies have no chance. They, he wipes them out. What's his weapon, by the way? The Word of God. Amen. A sword that comes out of his mouth, that is the Word of God. Right? And, and we get to be there in that. Praise the Lord, I'm looking forward to that day. But that is the second coming. And then Christ sets up his millennial reign here on earth, thousand year reign. 
where we get to rule and reign with him. And then there's that one final, and I'm saying this because we're going to cover this next week, that one final rebellion, Gog and Magog and all of those names. And, and Satan, the Bible says, is bound for the thousand years. He is loosed. And then he gathers from the four corners of the earth all of the armies that he can for one final rebellion. And the Bible describes it as the number of the enemy army is, with, is like the sand of the sea. It's without number. And yet, you know what happens? God says, and wipes them out with fire from heaven. It's not even a fight. God takes care of it. Do I have to worry? Nope. Nope. I just know that's what the Bible says is going to happen. Praise the Lord, I get to be on the right side. Not because I'm a good person, not because of anything I've done, apart from understanding that I'm a sinner and I needed a Savior and I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And I get to participate in that. And so back to our Revelation 1 through 3. Jesus never says that these are church ages. He never makes that intimation. He's addressing the conflicts and the struggles and the trials and the problems in these individual churches. Smyrna and Thyatira and Pergamos and Sardis and Philadelphia and on, on and on down the list. Right? And to have a view that these are church ages has to be uh, imposed on the Bible text. In other words, I have to come with that notion and come to the text with that understanding or that belief to, to, to try to see that because if I just read it at face value and had a literal historical interpretation of the Bible, what we would call a proper exegesis or interpretation of the Scripture, if I just read it, I would never come to that conclusion. I wouldn't do it. I would understand these are just churches that Christ is, is, is recognizing and he is dealing with. All right? Because if I come to the Bible, and, and we'll finish with this, if I come to the Bible with some preconceived notion that I believe this is what it says, rather than taking it at face value and allowing the Spirit of God to give me interpretation, that is very dangerous ground. And I can make the Bible say whatever it is that I want to say. Right? I can put any kind of, of improper interpretation on those things. By the way, uh, you want to know a good book where that's happened? Revelation. <laughs> that's why I say, ask five people, you're going to get ten different explanations about how to interpret the book of Revelation. About what does this mean? What does this symbolize? When does this come? All of those things. Right? Do we believe these are the end times? Yes. Do we see carnality in the church today? Yes. But do we also see that throughout the New Testament as well? Yes. So I need to, to interpret, read my Bible with an original historical context. That is, I need to ask some questions like um, who, what, when, where, why, how. Those investigative questions that you learned in third, fourth, whatever grade that was. I need to come to my Bible and ask those kinds of questions. And then, the, the, uh, as I read through my Bible, I get my, in, my uh, application for, for today's time through that lens, through that way of interpreting. I take what it meant historically and originally, and then I make application to my own life and to the lives of those that I'm ministering to. Okay. One verse. I want you to see it, and I promise that's we're done. Look at chapter 1, verse number 19. Because this is that outline that I was talking about. Chapter 1, verse number 19. Here's a great little outline for the book of Revelation, and, and we're finished. Here's what John is told, chapter 1, verse number 19 of Revelation. Write the things which thou hast seen, and by the way, he does that in verses 1 through 17 of chapter number 1. The things which thou hast seen. God gives him visions and he writes those things down. Okay? So the next thing is then, Roman numeral 2 on your outline, the things which are, that is those letters to those churches, chapter number 2 through chapter number 3. And then, beginning in chapter number 4, and here's what we're going to get to next week, and the things which shall be hereafter. Right? So there's how I outline the book of Revelation, the things which I have seen, the things which are, the things which shall be hereafter. All right? And you can use that little outline to help you to get where are we at kind of in this narrative of the book of Revelation. 
All right, keep your outline. We're going to be back there next week, and uh, we will finish off talking about the, the, the divisions and kind of what makes up and what's included there in the book of Revelation. Just a couple of, of announcements. We'll pray and, and dismiss you. Ladies' outing is Saturday. If you haven't yet signed up and you, you wanted to, you can see my wife. Uh, she'd be happy to get you on the list for that. But you're going to leave from the church here on Saturday at 10 o'clock, going down to Wimberley. Uh, it's supposed to be a little cooler, so I'd bring some, some warmer clothing. Uh, but if you can let her know if you haven't already, uh, you're going to have a great time down there. And she'll be able to tell you a time frame and all that as far as the return. Uh, O-Week is also Saturday. So those of you that aren't able to go, we'd love to have you come and, and uh, go with us uh, out in the neighborhoods and invite folks to church. Seniors Lunch is next Tuesday. And for that, we're going to provide uh, food. If you will pr bring, if you're a senior and you're coming, if you'll bring a dessert for that, um, that's all we'll have you bring. And we'll, again, we'll have that here at the church. And then cookie decorating is, is going to be Thursday. And then caroling will be Thursday evening. I believe we'll meet here about uh, 6 45 or so. Uh, if you can, we'll head out from here and then come back and have some hot chocolate and coffee and goodies and all that kind of thing. So looking forward to that as well. Let's stand. We'll be dismissed in a word of prayer tonight. Let's pray. Lord, thank you very much again for this book. Thank you for the promise of blessing, just for even reading it and hearing it read and for studying it. Lord, we're, we're grateful for that, that uh, promise. So Lord, help us please to uh, come to the Bible, not with preconceived ideas or notions, but Lord, just take it at what it says and then to interpret it through that and then use that for motivation why we ought to be out in our neighborhoods and at our workplaces and in our schools, uh, sharing the gospel message with other people because, Lord, we, we know what is coming. And so, Lord, help it to, to, to do that in our own heart and life. Take us safely home. Bring us back safely to the point in time. We love you so very much. We ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.